3.43 p.m. I am now calling the special call committee. The whole meeting to order it is Thursday, December 15th, 2022. Um, I'll take roll call. Uh, what is Council Abbott. Uh, Council Woods is not here. Council Williams is not here. Uh, Council Quinn. Present. Uh, Councilor Moore is not here. Myself is here. Madam President is not here. Uh, Councilor Clark is not here. And Councilor Tate. Okay, we don't have a quorum, so we can't vote on the minutes from the last meeting, but we can still hear the presentation. So we'll go to item number three new business A, C, click, fix. We'll bring up Ms. Alicia Lumpkin that will speak on this item to this committee. Thank you again for having this special call meeting, counselors. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. My name is Alicia Lumpkin, and I serve as the Director of Process Improvement for um, the Mayor's Office of Accountability. And today we're here to talk to you a little bit about our Civic Plus technology implementation into our 311 system. And so a while ago at the beginning of the year, or at the beginning of the year, we came to you and shared a little bit about the status and the update of where we are. So today is, is a, it's an update as well. We're going to tell you what we've been doing and what we are hoping to do in the next couple of months. So before we jump into the crux and the meat of the presentation, we wanted to just share some numbers with you. So since January the 1st of last year until November of this year, um, our system or our call operators have answered 69,800 calls. Um, and we've had 45,000 calls to roughly 45,336 requests to go into the system. Um, that's important to note because we want you to understand the sheer volume that is currently running through our system and going to and being routed to the various departments that you see over here listed on the side. Um, our teams are out there working and even though we are tweaking the system and making updates, um, work is still happening. So that's important to know. If you'll go to the next slide for me. So the next slide is just an overview of the process intake um, and how um, our new system flows from beginning to end. As you note, you can see one, um, how cases and requests come through the system and they flow into the departments and the divisions and then eventually um, get responses and emails out to our residents. Um, we're bringing this up and showing you that because we know in the past that we've experienced some issues with cases being closed out ahead of time. Um, and so what we're doing is making sure that we are updating our business processes and implementing procedures in place with our departments to make sure that things like that don't happen. And so we're having to spell out our safeguards and spell out our safe measures on the back end to make sure that things like this um, doesn't happen in the future. And so that's just a quick view. So let's really get into it. What have we been doing since we've spoken with you all last? That's the question. And so our biggest uh, venture, we would like to say, is um, the merger of our code enforcement teams, you know, taking our code enforcement team from DPW, merging it with um, our PEP team, that was huge for us. In addition to that merger, there were some upgrades that needed to happen to support that actual transition in C -click Fix. So some of those things were taking place during that time as well. In addition, we were able to deploy a project management consultant to assist DPW in identifying creative ways to build internal systems. So we had to be able to build and create tools and systems to be able to navigate the new um, technology that we have in place. And so we employed um, consultants to be able to help us with that as well. Which led us to the space of cleaning up. There were just cases that were existing in the system that needed some that needed to be closed and cleared out. And so DPW, um, under the leadership of Josh Yates, um, they closed out around 4,000 um, missed bulk trash cases in the system that were open. Um, they were able to resolve about 1,300 outstanding pothole complaints that were outstanding as well. And so they were really in there working to clean up the system to be able to support the technology to make sure that it's running efficiently. 
Um, in that, again, I, you've heard me mention updating our business practices. That was really, really important for us. And so it's one thing to just have the new technology, but you also have to make sure that you're updating your processes internally as well. And so having the consultant to come in and making sure our departments were honing in on the gaps that we had was very, very important for our team. And so making sure that our back end users really understood the workflow and the process and how things flow through the system um, when making when closing out opening cases um, was huge for us and we will continue to um, work on those things as well last time we were before you we also um, we were waiting to hear back from Apple on our branding piece um, however since then it has been solidified and our app name is my Beham 311 and so you'll hear a little bit a look I'm sure Shonda did you pass it out so you may have a flyer that has a QR code on it um, right now from that space you're able to take your phone scan one of the QR codes and be able to access the app from your Android or iPhone um, and that's really really big for us uh, one thing to notice that the system has been up and working the only new component that you'll see is this function from the app. It's just a new vein for residents to be able to report requests easily um, as, as opposed to calling in and getting in front of their computers. Another piece that we were working on when we spoke with you last was bridging our, our technical gaps um, for our call operators, um, making sure they had the information they needed to be able to retrieve um, residential information on those calls. So that was a piece that we were able to um, complete and provide support. The next space, we're just going to review our timeline and show a little bit of where we were and now where we're headed. Um, as you remember, in phase one, it was the whole beta launch. Um, only the system was only available to a small group of users. Phase two was the soft launch. The portal became available where people were able to go online onto our website and report cases in that manner. Um, we were still in those spaces doing some data migration into the new system at that time. Um, in phase three, we were able to just really take a step back and review and evaluate the system to kind of see and identify where our gaps were. During that time, we established a meeting cadence with our our, with our mayor's office leadership um, and in that space that's when we were able to bring in the consultant to be able to help us you know shore up some some of our ends our loose ends all right phase four is where we are now we are preparing to launch um, the C clip I mean our my Beham 311 on January the 24th of 2023 um, and as I made the slip myself one thing to note is we want to get away from that C click fix tag that we've all been you know saying for the longest and we really want to brand this as my Beham 311 um, you'll be able to search that in the app on your phone and we're going to have it on our website um, under the um, leadership of Rick Journey and our pu Office of Public Information um, they're really getting a campaign together that will make it easy for residents to be able to register and to submit complaints show them how to register and submit complaints easily from their phone or their desk um, and then phase five is where we're heading is the public announcement which will have a community engagement component as well and I'll talk a little bit about that next all right so phase five is the um, is the resident engagement there will be a few things included in that campaign of course we'll have instructions like you have today on how to report and create um, profiles and register your accounts um, you'll have video tutorials, social media announcements. Um, we'll also update our website, our 311 website, to have FAQs um, and to just share the importance of tracking cases and getting case numbers. And so we'll make sure that residents have every opportunity to ask us questions, um, but we'll also provide them information that they need to be able to navigate the system both on their phone and on the portal. Um, and then we'll partner with our CRRs to make sure that they're able to um, disseminate promotional materials as well. And finally, just to kind of sum this up, what have we learned and what's next? So after the lunch, we've learned um, that this is not a static 
process or project that is ongoing and that as things continue to move, we'll continue to update our system and we'll continue to make um, upgrades. Um, as you heard a couple of weeks ago that um, DPW has a new routeware that's coming online. And so having that to be able to interface with what we have here at 311 is big for us. Um, it's going to raise, the, it's going to make us more efficient in how we report out. Um, some of the new technology that's forthcoming in PEP will be able to talk to C I mean, be able to talk to our system as well. Um, and so we're excited about those opportunities that are forthcoming. Um, in addition, we have a, our um, our vendor, Sagayo, who's going to help us to create um, some some really, really custom reporting for us. And so they've been showing us drafts of some potential reporting measures and tools that we'll be able to use in the future. So it's not over. Um, this project is going to continue. But at this phase, every piece and every um, component of the project will be launched as far as having our residents to be able to utilize the tools that come along with um, the product. So I'll pause and, and leave the door open for any questions that you may have. OK, perfect. That was a really good presentation. Uh, counselors, do you have any questions? Councilor Abbott? I'm sure you said it, but if we've already downloaded the C Click Fix app on our phone, do we still need to load another app on our phone? We would like for you to download ours. Um, okay, it, so is it, it the same thing? It's not. It's um, not. So C Click Fix has a, a general app that they have, and it looks different. Um, ours has, if you look at the presentation, it looks more like what you see in this document here. Um, but it's really, really specific to city, the city of Birmingham. And so C Click Fix has its own landing page and web portal, but we also have our own. So what we want to do is to get people away from the C Click Fix general um, technology and get specifically to my BHAM 311. Um, so you don't have to, but we, we would encourage you to do so. So if you switch, do you lose everything that you've turned in? No, ma'am. Um, you'll keep it because it's under, your, it's under your name. Do you have an account? So all you would do is sign it under your account, and the information should um, pop up. OK. Thank you. OK. Um, Councilor Quinn? Um, so my number one question is, um, when will the council be able to see the data? So, you know, even under the current platform, um, I would expect that there's a, a dashboard that shows the different, you know, not only the number of complaints that have been received, you know, how many have been resolved, what categories they fall into, the geographic areas, heat maps, um, all of that type of stuff. I, I, I feel confident that everybody on the council uh, wants to see that type of information to know what's going on um, in their district. So I'm, I'm eager to get that kind of information. So that's part of the piece where we, we're, we're, con we're working on. Um, so some of that specific information based on district, based on neighborhoods, that's what we're having to get overlaid into the system working with our GIS team. And so while um, we, we're working on getting a lot of that broken down specifically for you all, when we're in our conversations with um, Sagayo, that's the request that we're having. We need it to be information to be broken down specifically by neighborhoods and districts. And so while we do have some general information and we can work to maybe speak with the administration to get you some numbers, the specifics and how it's broke down would take us a lot more, it would take a lot more time to dig through at this moment, but current, but we're working on getting a solution so it'll be easier and you'll be able to see it easily on a dashboard. Right now, that's not where we are. Okay. Um I know, uh, you know, that I would be interested, I, you know, look, I understand that this is a, a new system mm -hmm. um, and that it's going to be an evolution and that we're always going to be striving for improvement. Um, so at least for me, you know, I'm not expecting anything near perfection, you know, here at the, the very beginning. Um, but having you know we're coming from a place of very little information um 
and you know anything you've got basically I, I would find value in it okay um i mean yeah. even you know under the old system 311 uh would send us you know monthly reports saying these are the types of calls we're getting um and and that was useful for us you know um your average you know resident may not know that you know stray dogs were a really common call you know so um that's the type of thing um that can help inform you know our communications to our residents and, and you know also on the policy side you know is there something that we need to to do to make an adjustment um in terms of you know our ordinance or you know our operations um so you know again I, i'm not expecting perfection you know i understand that this is going to be all of this involves um learning a, a new way of doing things um for everybody you know top to bottom um to understand this new way of doing things and and that it's not going to be um a, a quick process you know uh so um but along the way um please don't you know uh, you know wait until you you feel i mean i would encourage you don't wait until you feel comfortable sharing information to share information you know uh, um I, this is not coming from a position of judgment it's more just wanting to 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 know um what's going on you know and and like i said you know any information is is better than none Noted. Thank you. Absolutely. Oh. Uh, Chief Sparks. Yes, yes, ma'am. Thank you, Madam Pro Tim. Counselor, really fair question. One of the things that the team was really working to do, I think it was almost to ensure that the, the plane was completely built before presenting it because the previous discussion obviously has been a few months and what they wanted to do was roll out a fully aggregated system. But what we've learned is it's pretty complex, especially with the outstanding cases that existed prior to moving into this system. And so one of the things that I think would be helpful is like what your question was. You say, as you all move forward, which is what we've challenged them with doing, just give us a steady drumbeat of info to show where we are, how we can access what's out there. That's, that's the plan starting in January, because what we've learned over the course of the last year is it is it's fluid because it's so much information that was either just sitting out there that they've tried to close out, that they've tried to integrate into this new system. So we'll do that. And if there are any other questions that you're like, hey, as we as you all continue to build this plane, also share X, Y, Z with us, whatever questions that you all have on that. And we'll try to marry the two, continue to build the plane, but, but be transparent with you about where we are in the process. Yeah. OK, thank you. Um, my next uh, question is, I'm thinking beyond phase five. Um, so, you know, the, the, the start, the initiation of, of this going to the system, um, the, you know, the, the foundational piece of it is having a centralized mechanism for people to report to us. So for our uh, residents and stakeholders to to be able to communicate to us about things that they see um, that need to be addressed um, but the capacity of the system is also to communicate out so um, in in the little diagram on page two I don't see the PIO office in in this network um oh so uh you know again we're at the beginning um but there's there's capability in the future and uh i just wanted to point out you know that we do have the capacity to push information out through through the system um and 
you know, so there's lots of communications, you know, there's the, the video that we're going to see about the, the trash cans and, you know, all that sort of stuff. Um, and then, you know, maybe even like a third step beyond that, I, I would really like us to um, use this platform to collect information from Uns collect, unsolic well, solicit information, and I'm, what I'm thinking about is is like survey type of thing, you know. And because all of this is integrated in GIS, you can really um, get you know street level feedback from folks when there's you know a particular situation happening you know in a specific geography we can uh, actually collect data from from citizens and and you know um, anyway no but that that's a great point and that's another reason why we would prefer that you use our app and our technology because when we get to that space and I can tell you from having conversations with Rick Journey he is excited about that component of being able to communicate directly to people through the app. Um, and so we were in the meeting with him last week and he was like, I can't wait, I can't wait. And so that is definitely on our radar. And that's another reason to make sure that people have our app instead of just the regular C Click Fix app because our push notifications will be able to stream through that. Yes, that's a big component and a big piece of, of this particular product for us is to be able to not make notifications and use that as a tool for communicating out. So you're right, it's not on this. Um, this was just the um, request flow chain, but yes, that is something that we, we're excited about being able to use um, down the road. Madam, Madam Pro Tem, yes, just Chief. to clarify, and she, she hit it on the head, the nail on the head, was this flow chart is really all the actual departments that will touch the service level of when people use the app or when they call 311. To your point, Council, we're not going to do the communication plan in a silo of just the mayor's office. We will have you guys involved to get the rollout, to get the word out, to make sure that people, as Ms. Lumpkin said, use our app and not just see click fix or just the old way of doing things. We want to make sure that everybody's integrated and speaking from the same sheet of music when we roll out this plan in, in January. So, yes, to your point, yes, we will make sure that you're involved in those communication plans so we can get it out to your residents so they can make sure they have the right app and to know how to use the app properly to get the, the workflow from beginning to end. Yeah, but, I mean, what I was, re I, thank you, I appreciate that, but what I was referring to is that, you know, the app is, um, you know, has the capacity to be an outbound communication tool as well. So, um, at some point, um, you know, the, the PIO office, or if it's some combination of, you know, the mayor's PIO and the council's PIO, there's just that capacity in the technology to be able to. Right. This communicate will, this will out. kind of be like a different version of Everbridge to where we can... Mm -hmm. Absolutely, I guess. yes, yeah. Yes. I, I got more, but anyway, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to back off for a second. Uh, Councilor Tate, ask her questions. Councilor Tate. Really, so, Ms. Lonkin, it's going live on the 24th, correct? Yes, ma'am. Okay. And, um... And I, I think I just want to kind of piggyback off of what Councilor Quinn was saying about, you know, having people uh, communicate. So this, because I think I'm understanding something like, like I got, we got ring bell. And when something goes on in the neighborhood, it pops up and you can see <clears throat> all of the comments that people are making. So are you speaking to something um, similar to that, Councilor Quinn? Like the ring bell, real time thing, like something's going down. Because I've gotten on ring bell before and see like stuff going on like in the neighborhood and I say like, wow, I can't believe that somebody actually came on somebody's porch and took their their package. So so are you speaking to something well, like that? You know, I d I don't know. Um I mean I think there's that capacity kinda in the technology already that if somebody wants to go within the app and kinda look around, you know, to see if they're what kind of cases, you know, are being reported and, um, you know, if the 
see click fix hasn't changed you know you can see all of the case reports uh, around a specific uh, location um, or or even click on specific reports and follow that report to see so you can get updates as it's resolved um, but what I'm talking about is more just general kind of being able to push information um, so I'm trying to think of, uh, you know, a good example. Like but a, if we had to miss a day of garbage collection in a certain district. Right. Yeah. Right, exactly. Yeah. Or that the city hall will be closed on Friday, so expect your trash to be collected on right. the following day. Right. And it'll come to your phone like a notification, like oh, any yes. of the other apps that you have. So it'll pop up um, and say, this is happening. Or even the stats, honestly, from 301, so they can uh, just... Yeah anything yeah i think that's a good idea yeah and so if people don't have like you know like most residents like some people are elderly like what kind of information would the mayor's team continue to push out would it be the mail outs like like we receive like the the um mailers in the mail you know for those who don't access internet to keep them updated you know on information yes, that's all the questions that i have i think this is going to be a very good system and so when we go out in the field and, and scan neighborhoods, continue go to this system and just put whatever you see out there. So are you able to take pictures and upload? Yes, ma'am. So okay. um, from your phone, you'll be able to take a picture, upload it immediately into the system. It'll, geo, you know, it'll pick up your location and um, you can submit the case. That's the beauty of the app. Um, it just makes it a little bit easier to do what we're already doing. Yeah. Um, so, yes, ma'am. Chief. Yes, so I do want to note, counselors, right now your teams, some of you, some of your teams are still submitting your bundles to our governmental affairs team. And I think it will still be a little bit of a hodgepodge of both until we can ensure that mm -hmm. we're capturing everything and that they're being closed out and reported out because it is dependent on our team members in the field reporting that is done and closed out. So that integration process will still take time to ensure that people are not following back up with you all or us saying mm -hmm. this was not done. So I, I still want, I want to make sure that we, we stress that it's the rollout that happens in January is not all inclusive or exhaustive so you still may have to have your teams assist in notifying when things are missed or you haven't heard back until we get to the point where we're both comfortable that the system handles it itself and we don't have to do follow-up but I want to make sure I stress that because we, we still will rely on you all and your staffs to notify us on some of those bundles through our GA team that's good chief because like you know I ride every day because I like coffee. <laughs> so I did see some things that I had reported and I, you know, told Brandon, hey, cross this out. Let Camila know that it's been done. So that's that's good. So it is going to take the effort, you know, of all of us because if you got those complaints out there, it appears if it's been done mm -hmm. that somebody has to go back out there and that may take time when it's really honestly has been completed mm -hmm. yeah so thanks for that it takes it takes the technology in the field as well which is a part of the integration that we're still doing yeah thank you chief um have we i don't know if you guys have thought about this doing maybe in-person tutorials for the seniors like maybe taking the main libraries i know we have a main one in every quadrant our rec center and then doing that even if it's just once i think that would help out a lot i think all of us instead of almost every neighborhood meeting us going through individually and helping them because you know our seniors it's some people just need in-person help so i didn't know if that was something that was thought of we can definitely um consider doing that and and, and run it through um we're going to work with our crrs as well um and our 311 um operator team will still be down to take calls if they are not able to get acclimate acclimated to the um That's to the app. Okay. Okay. I did um, see Clip Fix. I love it. I just submitted a complaint about a dead animal at a park, and then a week later, it was done. And then also, I like how you can share that complaint with other people so right. they can track it, and we're going to be able to do that as well. With my, okay. Yeah, I think it's, this is very, very helpful with complaints. Yeah. 
Yes. Yeah, Chief. So just wanted to clarify that this is not taking over the, the entire 311 system. This is just a tool and toolbox of the 311. People can still call into 311. Okay. okay. This still gives them an option to, a, a, I would say, a higher level option where you can send pictures and more detail than a phone call that where you can kind of have weird data, uh, weird conversations that may not get interpreted the right way. So. Yeah. Okay. So our, our call operate our call center is still viable. Um, you still can go online to our website and report cases. And now, um, like Chief Mitchell has mentioned, the the mobile app is just another way to be able to report cases for our team to continue to do what they're doing, what they're already doing. Okay. Gotcha. Um, Councilor Quinn, I know you have more questions. Uh, well, I mean. I can't emphasize how much, uh, how curious I am about the data. So um, gotcha. that's really kind of, you know, what I'm, what I'm after. But, you know, just based on the information that you've given us, um, gotten roughly 115,000 uh, reports uh, since January 1. And I was um, curious to, you know, you know, know how many out of that 115,000, um, you know, how many of those are du duplicates? Uh, uh, and, um, but more importantly, you know, where are we in terms of um, resolving those reports? So we we are actually we've our numbers have improved and I guess we'll make sure that we we share that information with you all. Um, last we checked, we were sending that um, I think about close to 80 percent um, closeout rate, um, but that fluctuates from month to month depending on what's going on. Um, so um, we'll make sure to, to get you some information and, and some information in our reporting so we can share that with you. Um, so you'll kind of see what we're doing because our teams um, have been working really, really hard to make sure that they are running their teams and getting their services completed in an efficient way. So um, we can definitely work to share the, that information with you. Chief. Yes, and thank you, Madam Pro Tem and Counselor. In all honesty, it's, it's really been interesting trying to identify the duplicates because that's been a problem very honestly we've 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 noticed that there's just a lot of duplication within the system so a, a, a total count of that is something we have not gotten our arms around that's why she's saying we're closing out items and then going back and seeing in the system that those items are still listed as open because it takes it takes a team member going back in and closing it out but when it's been entered by multiple residents it's been resolved here but it can still be listed by four or five other people. So making sure that if, if this issue is, in, is input into the system, regardless of who inputs it, then it aggregates that this is still the same issue. So it may appear as 10, but it's really one. It's just been entered nine different times. That's been a challenge, but that's a part of the process of the team members that are in the field knowing how to go in and say, we have to pull out this issue has been inputted and it's been closed out. That's been one of the challenges in terms of presenting back to you all when you say data, because the closeout rate has been good, Capturing if we're closing out items that are listed multiple times has been hard. So hopefully that's a part of the next steps. But I think to your point, I think you all would still be it would be good for you to know like this was listed 10 times. That's what I said. A part of the next steps would just be to share with you so you can at least see it. But that that piece has been a challenge to get our arms around. So is it. We're very advanced as a society with technology. There's not something, you know how you'll put something in and they'll tell you, oh, that's a duplicate. We can't put that in our app or whoever's designing it so they can do that. <laughs> no, yeah, I, was just think, I was just thinking about that probably would save a lot of time trying to figure that out by... Just right. Me. So um, there are phases of duplicate detection pieces okay. that um, that we are working towards getting to. Um, so it's a portion that the technology provides and it's a portion that our um, internal team has to do. And so we're working to make sure that they're in lockstep to make to ensure that the duplication piece is not a, a continued issue for us moving forward. So um, there are things again in the reporting piece that I mentioned that our vendor is helping us to do um, duplicate 
duplicate detection is one of those spaces that they're moving in and helping us to be able to narrow down on making sure that that then continue to be a huge issue. So we the re that reporting piece is some of the things that we're continuing to work out. Okay, gotcha. Oh, sorry, Councilor Quinn. Good. Thank okay, you. Okay, Councilor Abbott. Yes, I wanted to ask where the enforcement people are now located. Are they in a department or are they under you or? No, they are um, with PEP. So um, they combined um, DPW's code enforcement team um, just transferred over to PEP's code enforcement team and they're all running out of um, PEP now. Are they actually located with each other so they can no. talk or are they still? So that's a part of the integration too. So this happened um, at the start of the mayor's second term. Um, and so placing them into one space has been a part of the challenge as well because you're merging two departments. They do have one direct, one deputy director that they report to, Mr. Artemis Willis. And so the goal is to merge them so that they're all under one umbrella, but right now they're not. They're not in the same place right now. Okay. And then um, on this sheet, my BHAM 311, it says to visit our website, Birmingham spelled all the way out, dot gov slash 311. And then down in number two, it says visit www.bhamal.gov. Like, are we going to have two different? I can't see. Okay, because. When I when I did it, it didn't take me anywhere. It told me they couldn't find the server. Yeah, so so it's, what, what's before you is actually still a draft form until we have the, the final release in January. We just wanted to show you what okay. it would look like in our marketing of the actual app. So I'm excited for yeah. a minute because I'm tired of yeah, writing was, Birmingham. We're, but we're <laughs> supposed to put draft on there so it wouldn't be, you know, the actual. Now, you don't want yeah. us to go make copies no, and yeah, get yeah. it to all no, our yes, friends. Please, no. this is yeah, for this, you this all. This is just a draft. Right. Um, <laughs> We'll give you some additional information at the top of the year when the official launch happens. And so at that point, we would like for you to disseminate that information, not what we've given you today. Um, this is just for your eyes only to see what's <laughs> coming um, at the top of the year. Okay, so we can't even sign up ourselves yet because it isn't really there. No. It is really you there? So. Right. So this okay. information right here is for the portal, the website, and not the app. But if you go to um, if you go to your app store um, on your phone, it will take you to you type in my BHAM three one one. It will pull it up on your phone right now. Oh, okay. Well, that's good. And, um, so, um, but this this is actually just for the website. This information here. So the QR code is it working? It is working. I don't know why man said no search. Results. Have an iPhone or do you have an iPhone? Well, yeah, it told me that they they couldn't get to the server too. So I tried scanning it with my iPhone and it uh -huh. it couldn't find anything. But in this room, for some reason, I get that mm -hmm. I can't find the server a lot. Okay. So. If you will allow us to do this, like Chief Mitchell said, we will go back. This is a draft. Look at the QR code because it did work. But in the meantime, we can share with you the two links, the one for your Android and the one for your iPhone. Also, we can send you a play-by-play -play on how to, up, how to work with the app. That's the only handout that you do not have today because it is very long. There are about eight steps. But once you get into the app, it's very easy. It takes less than five minutes. Okay, and another thing that happens is if you take photographs of issues that you see and you go home and do see click fix it uses your home address and says that's where the problem is. So if there's a way to fix that, you know, you hate to have to park in front of all the problem areas and, and enter something if you can go home and do it from your house, but I don't want a bunch of guys coming to my house to fix sewers and stuff that I don't have. <laughs> you should be able to, once you upload that, go in there and just put a new address. Well, in. I mean, you put, you put the address where the problem is, but it still thinks that you're at the problem. The C-click fix, anyway, maybe ours will be better, but it uses yeah. the address where you are when you turn it in instead of the address that you input. So yeah. we, we, we just need to we yeah, need to we'll, workshop let, that. Let us workshop That's good that. To know. We yeah. 
Um, and we'll we'll follow up with you just to make sure. And it, and it may this is kind of what we need. Um, if you are experiencing difficulties um, getting your information in, we want to make sure that we iron this out before it goes um, to the public. And if it is us walking you you know through it, then that's what we need to do as well. So um, we'll we'll follow up to make sure that we're able to address that issue or your concern or be able to better understand yeah. so we can better I mean, explain. All it needs capacity. to do is take the address that you put in rather than the one that some satellite right. found you. Yeah, you know. it, it'll default to where you are, but there should be a, a way that you can go in and change it. Um, and I've changed it before, so we just need to walk through to see what you're seeing so we can make sure um, that we're able to give you the support that you need to be able to um, submit your complaints. Yeah, good. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. All um, right. Are there any other questions? Okay. Thank all you. Right. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, next item, uniform trash bins. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Hope, hope you all are doing well today. Um, I do have a presentation. And we'll start off going to the first slide on it. Uh, Talking a little bit about our CART program in general. Uh, that's just one piece of the puzzle. I want to keep everybody uh, reminded. I keep this slide up here on, on every presentation I do to talk about because every individual aspect of waste management um, revolves around what we're doing. It's not just a CART program. It's not just a recycle. It's not just route optimization. There's several pieces. And we've touched many of those, including um, our recycling components, our route optimization, equipment upgrades that are in the process right now, uh, litter, um, quality of life, educational components. Uh, so I'd just like to remind there's certain elements that we haven't gotten to yet that's going to continue to expand upon our, our reach on our waste side, uh, but uh, we, we have made significant progress. Uh, going to the next slide, we have um, completed phase one uh, of the rollout. We initially had a pilot program that consisted of 24 hundred households across the city. Uh, this phase one rollout included 20,000 and uh, it's gone fairly well. Um, I judge that based off the amount of complaints that we're seeing coming in uh, from our residents and also from our supervisors in the field. Uh, we put on here, I was listing, uh, at the time I, I, I created uh, the pre presentation here, I only had one email on the 14th uh, from the pickup at BirminghamAL.gov that went out to 20,000 residents. Uh, so um, we've had a, a roughly around 400 emails come into that, but they significantly tapered off as we addressed the issues and, and proceeded through. In addition, um, across the entire city, we have 32 open complaints on missed garbage. That's it, across the entire city. Um, so uh, we're addressing those one by one each and every day. We expect new complaints to come in, and we, we, we try to put those out as fast as possible. Um, phase two rollouts expected in early 2023. Uh, so we're working that down right now. A lot of questions have come about about am I getting a cart? Uh, is my neighborhood getting a cart? The biggest issue with me telling you yes or no right now is the fact that we're running routes and we're putting carts on the routes. It takes a special truck to pick the carts up or a truck with tippers. And so because of that, uh, it, it, it does prevent us from saying just this neighborhood or just this area, it's a route that we're running. <clears throat> One of the things that I noticed the other day, this was not prompted. Um, I drove through 18th, 19th Street in Inslee, uh, took pictures of the actual road conditions as I was driving through, and was very impressed with the, the area. These are photos as I was driving. I, I uh, just couldn't help but take pictures. With the carts, there was no litter around these areas. I think in one of the pictures you can see a bolt pile down the road. Uh, but uh, this is one of the main uh, thoroughfares through, through, through the Inslee area. And um, as I was driving through, I just couldn't help but take the picture. The carts were out. Uh, they'll be there one day a week. Hopefully we bring them back to the, to the curb, uh, back to the house from the curb. Um, but it really made the street look better uh, as I drove through. There was, there was no scattered garbage uh, as we drove through. Um, moving to the next slide, I wanted to talk a little bit about code changes. So in terms of code changes, what we wanted to do to bring before the, uh, this committee is talk about a few things and then we will come back at a, uh, 
a later time with the actual, if this body is, wants to move this forward, we'll come back with a later time with the actual technical code changes written down. But I wanted to bring before you the actual changes, what they actually are in code uh, that we were looking at. It uh, starts out with uh, service only what's in the carts. So a lot of our missed garbage complaints are not that we missed the garbage, it's that we didn't pick up the garbage that was left on the side, on the top, or then the extra carts around, around our garbage. And as we roll this program out, we are only servicing what's in the cart on those carts. Um, second item is the additional cart. If our residents do request a second, second cart, third cart, uh, I wouldn't be surprised if we don't get four cart requests. Um, $120 is basically what it costs us uh, to take the cart out to the house. The actual cost of the cart and then for us to distribute it, uh, put it on a trailer, take it to the house. So it's right around $120 per cart. Uh, that's something important because we have had a lot of requests for those. Uh, and, and you know, when we rolled this out, we anticipated one, one cart per household, one cart per single family residence. So we have had a lot of requests for additional carts. Uh, so that's something that, that we wanted to put into the code and codify the, the cost of them so that, that the city wouldn't continually bear that cost over and over again just because people want additional carts. Um, another code change is bagged garbage. <coughs> that's in there now, but I just wanted to reiterate that, that we still request that the garbage be bagged. Uh, the reason is that when it's in transport or uh, as we, we move uh, to dump it, uh, we don't want any litter fly, flying free. Uh, we want to make sure that the carts are uh, free of any obstacles, so three feet on each side. Uh, there's a good video at the end that we'll show that kind of demonstrates this. Uh, but right up next to the utility pole, right up next to a mailbox or a parked car, our truck and the call on the truck can't reach out and grab the cart. So we need to have three feet on each side of the cart. Uh, front street service pickup. There is a clause in there because we have gotten a lot of requests that if it is determined by the Department of Public Works that we cannot service on the front, we will look to see if we can work in certain areas to service in the, in the alley. But that's really uh, an exception to the rule. We want everybody to be on the front. It is very hard to service in the alley due to overhead power lines. Uh, basically, it's going to be a manual operation as long as we're servicing in the alleys. When we're on the fronts, we, we can do it a lot more automated and more efficient. Uh, we want to make sure that it's codified that we return the carts within 24 hours. Um, that's, that's something that we want to put in the code uh, so that our carts just aren't sitting out on the street. Um, additionally, uh, refu uh, refusal to utilize cart service uh, can interrupt uh, your waste service in general. Uh, that's something that we, we have to make sure. Believe it or not, we, did, we do have, as we went across 20,000 residents, we did have some people refuse to take our cart. Uh, so that, that has happened and uh, can pose some problems if we don't put it in the code. Um, if there is no cart, if you have not been delivered a cart, uh, we will continue our same service we have been, which includes twice a week, and we'll pick up uh, the service, at the waste there on the curb. Uh, theft or damage to a cart <coughs> uh, is the same price as just an additional cart. So if we put hot ashes into a cart, somebody, uh, we, we grill and throw the hot ashes in the cart and it melts the cart. Uh, you know, I don't want to put the city in a position to constantly be replacing people's carts. Uh, put in here in a cart cost for that. I also had on here an item for theft. If a waste cart is stolen from the, the street, that's one thing. Most of the time it's going to be filled with garbage, and then it's brought back to the house. If it's brought back to the house, it's very low likelihood that somebody will steal the cart. Uh, so, uh, that is in there as well. Um, four waste container units. This is one that I actually, um, let's see, it's up there right, uh, right now, but on the following slide we'll talk, go in detail on the existing code today. Uh, right now we, won't, we, have, uh, we want to serve four waste containers or units only. Currently in code allows up to ten. So um, the way we work today is if you have ten or less units, we service your waste. And really, if you have an apartment complex with 10 units, you need to have a dumpster. And uh, we've had a lot of problems with that. Um, so part of that, though, is with one cart provided, duplexes, triplexes, quadplexes, uh, they, they would be required to buy the second, third, and fourth cart based off of the way we had it right now. And most of these are associated with business-type operations uh, for the purchase of the cart. The way it's set up right now, 
uh, based on the way we're moving with code, we require that, that cost to be paid by the owner of the apartment complex or whatever it may be. Um, to put in perspective there, if I were to own a duplex and I live in one side and rent the other out, um, I would be responsible. I would be making income from the renter. Uh, I would be responsible for providing a cart there. Um, and then the code sections on that on the next slide, um, this kind of details and goes in, into detail. And it's, hopefully you all have a print out of that. It's kind of hard to see on the screen. Uh, but it talks about the 10 units or 10 dwelling units uh, and, and basically where we are today. Um, and we really just want to see that move down to four. Uh, so that we can service units, you know, up to four. We, you know, the real big apartment complexes have posed a big problem for us in a lot of areas. Uh, and this is a way to reduce it down uh, to service only four at max. Um, and then the final slide, I believe, is just the video. Uh, I wanted y'all to see what uh, Mr. Journey and the OPI team put together uh, for, um, for us, if we can play that. Birmingham's new garbage cart system is simple and easy to use, but there are a few things to remember. All garbage placed in new, complimentary 96-gallon carts must be bagged. Garbage placed beside the cart or on top of the cart will not be collected and could prevent pickup. When placing the cart on the street, make sure the opening of the cart faces the street like this. Use the arrow on the cart as a reference. If the front of the cart is not facing the street like this, or this, it cannot be picked up. If the cart is within three feet of a utility pole or another object, it is too close for the automated truck to pick it up. The placement of this cart allows the operator of the city's automated trucks to quickly empty the cart and move to the next house. The new collection system will provide a more efficient garbage pickup system. And as always, remember to take your cart back to your house after pickup is complete. Thank you for your cooperation. So that was, uh, that was sent out through our social media channels um, and is, is an item that we really wanted to push out uh, to show people how to utilize the carts. Great job by the team all together for that. Um, but. Those are, those are the items before us today. If there's any questions or concerns, I'd be glad to address any of those. Uh, yes, Councilor Abbott. <clears throat> yes. Okay, so there are many neighborhoods in my district that have no parking. So everybody parks on the street. So where is the garbage going to be picked up? So They even, have alleys, but, you know, the alleys are extremely narrow. Yes, ma'am. So e even when we park on the street, uh, the cart just needs a three-foot window uh, on each side. That's really six or eight feet. Uh, it, it can be really anywhere in that window. Uh, we've had some conversations. We started out on this on phase one, doing a lot of the areas that are already front service. Uh, phase two will likely include the same front service, easy, easy operation already, uh, where they don't have parking on the front. As we move into phase three and phase four of this rollout, we will get into more of those areas that will have more challenging surfaces like what you're talking about with parking on the front. There's conversations ongoing right now with Director Fowler and others just do we look at curbing, yellow curbing one side of the road for that particular day of pickup. Um, we've also I've instructed our drivers if I needed to um, you know, provide something to show you where, where we can put these carts in certain areas, where, whether that's a you know, a dot of spray paint on the pavement or something showing where you can put a cart. Um, we, we're working through all that with our drivers right now, too. And also a form to, to let people know if, they, if any of those items that we had on that instructional video are not completed that could prevent service. Um, we also have a tag for that so that we can start letting our residents know why their service could be interrupted if they keep doing this, this or uh, one of those violations that prevented us from picking it up. Yeah, because I see that it's a serious issue because the streets are too narrow for vehicles to drive on now. You know, people park on both sides, but that's because there's no place to park. So if you tell them to go park somewhere else, where are they going? Because all the parking is all full. It, it's, I'm, I'm, I'm really just eaten up with curiosity to see how it's going to work in, in neighborhoods that are so congested. Yes, ma'am. And in areas where we have uh, not the clearest plan of how to move forward, 
Uh, we will look at moving them towards the alley if we have to. Uh, it just more alley pickup involves more manual service. Uh, so the more we can put on the fronts, the better off we'll be. So we're going to look at every route, um, and we actually have our supervisors running those down each day, going through there where we can put our next phase, where the following phase, and where we run into issues that may prevent us from moving into this phase. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm just waiting. <laughs> but thank you. Yes, ma'am. Okay, right, thank you. Um, Councilor Quinn, do you have any questions? Yes. Um, okay, so first thing, uh, on slide five, the, the last bullet point was um, cut off. Uh, I think this was about removing the cart uh, within 24 hours. Uh, I just wanted to confirm. So the last little part of that sentence got caught, cut off. Uh, cart should be returned after pickup, but must be removed no later than 24 something. 24 hours following service, following our, our actual service pickup. Uh, okay, so, <clears throat> so they need to be pulled back from the street within 24, 24 hours. hours. Yes, following service. Okay. All right, um, as far as uh, I, I'm concerned uh, about people putting their carts on the sidewalk, where there are sidewalks, um, so is the understanding that the carts need to be placed within the, on the street, up against the curb, and, and I mean, is that, I just yes. wanna make sure that that's communicated that folks shouldn't be placing their cart on the sidewalk, you know, and blo blocking the pedestrian right away. Yes, sir. That's that's correct. It is to put it on the on the curb or where areas where we don't have curb and gutter. It'd be on the edge of asphalt. Um, that would be where we would want to put them. Okay. Um, so, did you say that households could be allowed under the? current conception that households would could be allowed up to four carts so under the current um, under the current code today we service up to 10 units per structure and also under the current code it mentioned up to f the businesses that we service up to four bags or four garbage containers and so um, while we haven't had the request for four containers per individual house I just wouldn't be surprised if I don't get one. Uh, we do have a request for additional carts in a lot of the houses. Okay. Let's start with single family residential. Um, I would have a problem with us allowing four carts for a single household. Um, you know, if you need four carts, then, then you've got more than just daily living going on. Um, and, you know, we shouldn't be subsidizing somebody's home renovation project or, you know, um, Airbnb business or party business. Uh, you know, I mean, that's, that's absurd. Four 96 gallon trash containers per week. Um, <laughs> I, 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 my personal feeling is is that if if you need more than two, um, then you need to be looking to some other service to be to help you out, and not um, having the sub, sub, city subsidize whatever activity you're doing. Or code enforcement needs to visit. We we can also look to add that in code by having a limit for the number of carts. Yeah, uh, it's just something that's come up a lot is additional carts, and so we weren't going to hand out additional carts. We you know we, we wanted to make sure. Right. Yeah, but I, I don't want to you know even allow them to buy more than two. That, that's my personal feeling. Um, you know, I'm one one out of nine, but uh, so counselor, uh, we actually kind of agree with you on that point. So we're kind of leaning towards. DPW having some type of recommendation with the council concurring and just agreeing that we may need to change the code so we can have code enforcement go out to these individual duplexes or 
apartment complexes to make sure they're not violating the rules of this this CART program. So we're leaning towards you to also to give us some type of recommendation also so we can make changes because if we don't have the law behind it, we can't enforce it. Yeah, so my recommendation, you know, would be two for a single family residential or, or for a household two. Um, I totally agree with the recommendation of, you know, if a, a building has more than four units, then you need to have privatized waste collection service, period. Um, now, if you've got a quadplex, you know, each household within the quadplex, again, my recommendation would be two, up to two um, carts per, per household. Um, the, and I want to touch on the, this is, I apologize, this is going to go in a little different direction, but you know, we have parts of the city where we're providing daily collection and those are largely commercial areas. Um, my personal feeling is that, you know, if you're in a for-profit business, um, you don't get the same deal as as a residential customer. Um, I just want to get that out there. That That is part, I mean, that has got to be a serious burden on public works to be doing daily service in some parts of the city um, where, you know, if you have a business that happens to be in this area, you, you get that special treatment but you know everywhere else if you're a commercial customer you're you know having to pay for garbage collection on your own um, I don't know you know I don't have a solution for addressing that but I'm trying to make your life easier <laughs> um, and and so at some point I would I would like us to to have a completely different category for commercial, you know, businesses. Um, I, you know, I think we're being taken advantage of in a lot of cases. You know, I, I was recently at a commercial business um, where the business owner had called us out um, to re re have us look at an issue that was unrelated to garbage. Um, but as I'm driving around the business, he's got stuff out there at the street that is clearly related to his business activity. And I told him, you know, look, the city of Birmingham does not con c collect from commercial properties, at least not in that area. Um, so I don't know that that's been clearly communicated but again you know um, trying to make us more efficient and effective and if you're in you know a for-profit business then you need to be taking care of your waste collection on your dime not on taxpayers dime yes sir um, I think that's yeah, it President. Do you have any questions? Councilor Tate. I'm just going to concur with <laughs> Councilor opinion. I wholeheartedly agree. Um, because we, the city of Birmingham is blessed. Yes. Let me just put that out there. Because I don't know how many of you all read the article about the residents in Valley, Alabama, that were being arrested for not paying for collection pickup. So people are blessed in the city of Birmingham. But I wholeheartedly agree with him that these for-profit businesses need to reach out to a waste management company, get you a big old dumpster, and start paying for your services. So once again, people in Birmingham are blessed. Thank you, Mayor. I'll have to add not only that, but clean it up, because Oh, Mayor Wolf and I had a time with Family Dollar off of Sixth Avenue. There was so much waste around the um, around their garbage uh, 
ban thing and you know they blamed us they were like why haven't y'all cleaned it up and we had to tell them like that's not our responsibility and we call it management because that's you know what we do we service people but i definitely agree um and we definitely need to keep these businesses accountable seriously so sorry you weren't done uh yeah i had just one more question so um can you just Describe to me what the so say there is a theft. Um, how are we gonna deal with that? You know, if somebody calls and says, "Hey, my my cart was stolen," um, what happens next? So my my opinion of that, my recommendation would be that we we ask the question of was your cart left at the curb or was it brought back in? Uh, if people are leaving their carts out at the road. The likelihood is that somebody will take it eventually if they're leaving it out. However, if you bring your cart back to your house, fill it up with garbage, and take it to the road, nobody's going to grab your garbage cart while it's full of garbage. And then once it's serviced, if we bring it back to the house, the likelihood of theft goes way down. If we see these carts in other areas of the city that are being utilized, uh, we will pull that cart back. Uh, you know, if somebody takes it and takes it to the other side of town and they, they're not on our cart program, that's easy for us to identify. Uh, and we know where that cart belongs and we'll take it back to the cart owner. But I think our, uh, right now the way it has, the way I laid it out in code, was it would be a cost of to replace that cart, the $120 cost to replace that cart. Well, we have the capacity to, I mean, my understanding is that the carts are equipped with RFID chips and, yes, I mean, I would assume that, you know, we'd have the capacity to ping, ping it and, you know, get a location of where where it is i mean that's not exactly how it works but it does have the rfid technology where we can when we come upon it we can identify where it is it's like a serial number uh, so it can tell you a lot of details about the cart um, we don't have the service that just tells you exactly where it is uh, but we do have the ability to tell you whether that cart belongs to you or not whether that cart belongs on this this area or on the other side of town uh, wherever it came from. So uh, we can tell exactly where that cart came from if we are to come across the cart. It, it's not a GPS, it's a, just an RFID reader there. Okay. That's not what we were told originally. Yeah, I, I think, yeah. Well, let me let me ask a question this way. So when the, the um, truck is picking up the cart, my understanding is that the truck is is reading that RFID at the same time that it's picking it up. Is that right? Once we get the technology in, in the trucks that we just signed the contract on, uh, yes, sir, that, that will be correct. Okay, so if that technology is in place, then in theory the operator um, could be alerted if that cart is in a location someplace other than what it's registered to. Absolutely, yes. Sir. Okay, but that's that's not in the initial rollout. That's so it's a part of the the, the actual technology is what we voted on, uh, what we brought to you uh, to vote on the other day with the route contract, um, and that's the cameras, GPS, RFID, route optimization. It's it's the educational components. It's that, that whole comp has just about everything that you're talking about right now, uh, but including the RFID readers. It'll be able to tell where that car belongs to. Um, basically, it tells you, uh, we'll give you a route, address route, and you can go to that route, and as you pick up the cart, it, it would be able to do that, as well as there's even sensors up that can be uh, added for the weights, how much we're picking up over, you know, uh, each time we tip the cart and things of that nature. Okay, House, Madam President. <coughs> Thank you very much. Um, I just want to say, I think this is my, today was my third pickup or second or third pickup. And so I know we've had to work some of the kinks out with um, residents understanding the process and feeling comfortable with it. So one of the questions I received from a resident, she'd actually gone out and she bought a can that she thought was very similar to our can. And it was, she sent me this picture and it was stacked full of trash and they didn't pick it up. So can you just explain how that truck is retrofitted for our can 
and that you really aren't increasing your opportunity for more garbage pickup by trying to buy a similar can. Um, and then give me some, uh, and I apologize for being late, but with the code changes, I do see that it has the one-time fee for someone needing a secondary cart. Would that be instituted once we approve and go in for these code changes? Yes, ma'am. Right now, I cannot approve. Chief. So, yeah, I wanted him to answer the first question, but yes, the second question say. is we, we, we really want to complete the complete rollout first before we, okay. before we start thinking about giving a second cart to somebody else. That totally makes sense. So if it, my first question, I guess I just would like for it to come from Public Works that you aren't helping yourself if you're trying to go out and buy a second cart on your own from another manufacturer. And the picture looked very much like our cart, but um, I just didn't know how feasible that was. Truly, it's not something we want residents to try to do. Yes, ma'am. You're, you're absolutely correct. Um, we are only picking up one cart per house right now because nobody should have more than one. Um, and uh, we're only picking up the cart that is, uh, it actually has a hot stamp showing the city of Birmingham logo uh, along with a serial ID and RFID chip. So we are only servicing that can at the moment. Okay. And the second concern or uh, one of the things, it got me a little bit as well. So if I buy a large item in a box, I need to break that box down and put it in a bag in order, because now I can't put the box out like I used to put it next to my trash can. And so would I, or would I need to wait and keep that at home until it's time for my bulk trash? The best way to be would wait for your bulk trash date, uh, but it could be broke down and put in the cart as well if you had room. Um, but either way would work for us. Okay. How about recycling? Yeah. Oh, that's true. Yeah. We so, have a recycling system in Birmingham. It's kind of weak, but you know, yeah, if you have a box, you should be recycling it. And, and to that point, I'll participate in the recycling program. Well, yeah, I, I mean, unless it has food that, in it or something. And, and, right. and, all and boxes and can be recycled. Of course, citizens also have the capability to go out to our landfills and not get charged a tipping fee. So, I mean, that is what an option. And then what Council Abbott was saying, they can actually go to a recycling hub and discard their, their actual. And that just more education for us as we start thinking of how we can be a part of that program. So I agree with that. Um, but I am seeing residents. Um, so let's. I'm worried. My only concern is it has to be in a bag, though. Yes. My only concern is if I have that additional amount of trash and I, I'm passing by some homes that there's still bags would look like trash out there and of course the truck can't pick up those empty bags so what should the resident do if they accumulated more trash they just got to wait for the next pickup and be sure those bags get into the yes, cart I would recommend that they put it in the cart after it's dumped mm -hmm. uh, they can also haul it to either one of our four di waste districts uh, there are containers there uh, those were really built for residents even though we had some contractors trying to come in there um, or they can go to the landfill or eastern area landfill. There's okay. a citizen drop off there as well. Okay. Uh, but the, the truck is designed to only uh, pick up a certain cart. Um, and we really don't want to be picking up private carts uh, because there is a possibility we could damage the carts. So. Okay. And I do want to thank you for the video and the, you all placing those. It, I, I came out that morning the first time and I almost thought, do I turn it this way or turn it that way? So I hadn't paid attention to um, the information you had sent ahead of time and then somebody went, duh, the arrows on there, so it tells you what to do. But um, I think some of them, um, I'm glad we're going through this first initial phase because hopefully some of those kinks and then I, I think just the biggest thing is educating the public on what this new system will be for us and as we go through this phase. No, Mr. Mayor, you know we can't hear you. <laughs> Madam President and Council, I commit, uh, we commit as an administration, along with you, to continuing to communicate about this and over communicate. So it's not just Tuesday Council meetings, it's not just um, our social channels. The video you've seen, for example, we'll probably play that video once a week, right? Not the same day, not the same hour, but um, we've already used direct mail. I think. We'll continue to use direct mail. We'll just continue to use every channel, um, neighborhood meetings. We'll continue to use next door. We'll continue to use every channel available to 
repeat the same information um, orienting our residents around this educating our residents around this and thank you and I do want to say I, I do feel this new this process also um, as Mrs. Abbott uh, stated there are a lot of situations where now we can utilize the recycling where we may have thought let's just put this in the trash and so now we have more of an opportunity it really helps us to increase people's use and for recycling so um, I see it as an opportunity for us to go there so I'll be looking forward when we go into second phase and we get a nice can for um, recycling as well but until then <laughs> we can use what we have thank you yes, thank, thank you, you. Ma'am. yes um, Councilor Abbott you had another question I do. I've got to leave, but I want to know the answer to this question, and that is, um, I'm sorry I have dinner guests coming, and I'm not going to, like, tell them to go to McDonald's. So um, the question is, when people take their cans away from the curb, do we have a requirement of where they take them to? Because we have people that are leaving them, like, in their yard, awaiting the next pickup so they can drag it out onto the city right of way but residences with garbage cans in the you know in the yard just it's horrible especially for the rest of the residents who don't want to look at people's garbage cans for the next 10 I, years I did not have that in a in a code item uh, but uh, we can certainly look into that. The main thing I wanted was to make sure we pulled them back off the right of way. Um, but we can look at that and, and see if there's, we can look at some other jurisdictions and see if they had some things. There are some codes I've seen where you've got to hide your car. HOAs a lot of times enforce that more so than the city has I've, that I've seen in other jurisdictions. Um, but I would say that that's something we can look at. Yeah, I mean, I think it's important because we don't want our neighborhoods to look trashy while everyone else's look good. And a bunch of garbage cans in the front yard just doesn't get it. Thank you. That was my only other question. Okay, thank you. Are there any other counselors or questions? Okay, thank you. Thank you. Okay, I am three. Oh, uh, was it the choice? Yeah, choice, choice grant. grant application. Can we do the minutes before council? Oh, yeah, oh, yes, right. yes, 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 um, yes. Let's go back to item number two, approval of the minutes. Counselors, have you had a chance to look at the minutes from the last committee of the whole meeting? Yes. If so, is there a motion for approval? Set. All in favor say aye. 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 The minutes from the last uh, committee of the whole meeting passed. We'll just listen to this for information purposes only. Oh, she's going to stay five minutes. Can you do it in five? <laughs> Let's do it. Five minutes. Um, we're just passing out a, a little pamphlet so you can see. So I, as many of you have, and some of you have already kind of heard our presentation, really, um, we thought it was important as we're getting close to our deadline, January 9th, to submit our Choice Neighborhoods Initiative grant that we really presented to you all so you understood what it was, what we're, what our plan is, um, and how we're thinking about the next couple of weeks as we're moving forward. And so just really wanted to bring to you a high-level um, presentation about what it is and what we're doing and so as many of you know, we're focusing on the Smithfield neighborhood um, with our Choice Neighborhoods Initiative grant. Um, and our tagline really is about honoring the past and envisioning the future, which has come from our community meetings and engagements with folks across the community and neighborhoods, really understanding that the the history of Smithfield is not only one that's critical to the city of Birmingham, but one that is nationally important and critical to the trajectory of this country um, and how we want to think about envisioning our future. Um, and so if you go to the next slide, just high level around the Choice Neighborhoods Initiative, it has three major components that incorporate the grant. Um, there's a people education portion, there's a housing component, and there's a neighborhood component. Really central to that is the housing component. That's where this grant came from. And all Choice Neighborhoods Initiative grants partner a city entity with a housing authority. And it, the intent is to revitalize a public housing site 
but not just think about what housing look like, looks like because we understand that housing alone does not make a thriving community, but think about all the other components that help to make a thriving community, which include people in education as well as neighborhood. Um, and this really aligns with kind of the Woodfin way and the way that we're thinking about development across the city, um, which is around economics, uh, affordability, health, uh, safety, education, and families. And so just wanted to demonstrate here how aligned this, this grant is with what we're doing already and how we're thinking about um, the future of the development that's happening within our department and across the city. And if you go to the next slide, this digs a little bit into more what the grant um, opportunity is. So the reason that this is a really important and exciting grant for us to go after because it's $50 million that comes into your community around housing and development, which there is no other HUD grant that provides this level of capital um, at one time that'll, and that really comprehensively thinks about um, development and what it looks like, not only in housing, but also around people, programs, infrastructure, et cetera. And so it's $50 million for which we have to match. So we have to demonstrate that we have leverage um, in our people programs, in our housing, as well as in our neighborhood and infrastructure uh, in order to score maximum points. And so we've really been looking and partnering, and we'll talk a little bit more about that. But what we forecast is that with this grant, we will be able to leverage up to $550 million over the course of the eight years, which is what the grant um, the grant cycle is, um, that will be able to have economic impact that reaches $242 million. We currently have over 60 partners. Um, we also are... Um, we realize that we will be able to create a thousand construction jobs just with the development of the housing in, in and of itself. And we have a really interesting model for how we'll do that to engage community residents um, in um, workforce development. And then we'll be able to create upwards of a thousand units of affordable and mixed um, housing, which again, there's no other opportunity for us to be able to create that amount of housing um, within one neighborhood across this um, amount of time. And so this is a really important grant because it's not just critical to the Smithfield neighborhood, but it's unprecedented development across the city, which will exponentially demonstrate not only our viability to take on this type of capital in the city of Birmingham, but also be able to attract more investment that really impacts all of our neighborhoods. If you go to the next slide, so some of the high level ways that we're promoting social equity and economic mobility is through these five kind of tenets around the preservation of house with a mix of incomes. So not so deconcentrating right the public housing site and really being able to have mixed incomes across the neighborhood that allows for di di vitality within our neighborhood. We're investing in people because we're thinking about early education, school performance, out of school opportunities, job training, and we believe workforce development is going to be a really key component to our gym in this neighborhood, um, and connecting people to assets, asset building, and wealth and health. Um, the economic impact is vast, a little bit about what I talked about um, a moment ago. And then also, this is an opportunity to think about excellence in design. So I've worked with a design firm before called Mass Design Group that says, um, design is not neutral. It either harms or it heals. Um, and so we're, there's an opportunity here for us not only to think about building new houses, but also to think about how design impacts health, um, opportunity, right, beauty, uh, and ultimately wellness of our community. And then bridging the digital divide. So it also is giving us an opportunity to think about innovation in a space all together when we have this type of capital, how we're not only building for what already exists, but how we're thinking into the future about what is available. And so as Dr. Thomas mentioned earlier, uh, this plan is really focused on more than just housing, but also how can we bring programs uh, to live families and neighborhoods. So there's a, a big investment in people uh, in our application. And so we have had about eight meetings uh, with the neighborhood thus far, uh, and we've had separate meetings, one to include uh, meetings with the public housing residents as well as the larger community, Graymont, Smithfield and College Hills. 
Also, a part of that, we have developed a uh, different task force. Uh, and so we have a housing task force uh, that consists of residents and stakeholders to help guide what the replacement housing should look like. Uh, we have a neighborhood task force, uh, which really guides with some of the, the amenities that we could bring into the neighborhood, such as green spaces. Uh, and then we have the people task force, which, con which consists of how to develop programs for the neighborhood. Uh, the next slide really shows um, a listing, a snapshot of some of our partners uh, in the various components. And so uh, on the housing side, you see we have our developer, uh, which leads that task force, which consists of Integral Rule, uh, which is out of Atlanta. They have been successful in choice previously uh, in Baton Rouge, as well as here uh, in Birmingham with uh, Park Place. Uh, previously and uh, the neighborhood component is being led by the city uh, we do have the Birmingham Civil Rights Institute as a partner a part of that in UAB uh, and so you can see we have a list of partners it goes on and on and on uh, we feel that we are in a much better place uh, than our 2020 submission <laughs> okay perfect <laughs> That's okay. all we have. We just wanted to provide a high level of kind of who our partners were at the table, how we're comprehensively thinking about the, the application, um, and obviously there's many more intricacies, but we're happy to talk more about those. And for clarification, Madam President and um, committee members, well, committee of the whole members, <clears throat> the submission is in 20, what, 20 what days? In 25 plus days. Uh, we'll be back with more detail or certain requests, uh, but in the meantime, we'll take any questions you may have. What I did share with two of your colleagues is that three are, well, two are here, um, but I didn't share, one was not here when I shared it with two others. That is, these three neighborhoods touch three separate council districts. So um, they're going to help me if I'm wrong. Uh, College Hills is nine. Oh, yes. Yeah. That's two. That's all we done. I was trying to tell you earlier. <laughs> changed, we changed a few things. <laughs> Never mind. Districts five and eight. We're going to jump straight to the questions. Uh, uh, counselors, do you have any questions? Counselors, hey. Mm -hmm. I, I just really want to commend Dr. Thomas and Corey. Mr. Starworth, like I really, really commend, and Mr. Datcher, let me not leave him out, but I really, really, <laughs> but I really like how you guys have really moved into swift action, and what really impresses me, and y'all know I'm real big on collective building and moving and centering the voices of those that live in community, because that's super important in anything that we do become the gun violence, whatever, because we got to think about this. These people live in these neighborhoods, and I think for so long, um, people have felt like they have been left out. But I really want to just give you guys your praises from me, like how you have really, really just, like your tenacity, especially you, Dr. Thomas, I love your spirit and how you take your public health background and bring, integrate this into this, because that's so important. And Corey, to you and to Mr. Datch, I really want to thank y'all for what y'all doing. May I thank you. So I'm really believing and I'm going to be standing with y'all that we are going to get this choice grant to move uh, Birmingham forward. So I'm excited, you know, and whatever, you know, y'all, you know, whatever y'all need from us. And again, how y'all have stepped up and uh, moved very swiftly. So I know from the North Pratt community, they super excited to continue you know, like you said, we got, had some great momentum to come back so we could tell those people how to, you know, get those homes. Because I've had a couple of people call about, like, hey, I want one of those houses. We're going to make sure that you get one. Thank you all so much. Okay. Uh, Councilor Quinn. Yes. Um, so we've already discussed uh, the larger Ar ARPA allocation um, that you know, it's going to be uh, assisting, but I, I just thought of something, you know, with um, one of our other programs that we want to um, 
move forward through the District 5 ARPA is uh, a partnership with um, UAB for securing the hammer math uh, curriculum and and having so I'm just thinking so that's a hundred thousand um, dollars to get that hammer math curriculum started in Smithfield at Hardware Park um, and it, you know, it just occurred to me with all of this construction, you know, around building new housing um, that we can, you know, utilize that program to actually train people in the community to then work on these construction projects. Yes, I love that. Thank you. I will reach out to you. About yes. That. Madam President. No. I'm just looking up hammer math, so I'm going <laughs> to. <laughs> Thank you, that's it. You know how Council of Queens, he'll come with a program we never heard of, and then he'll educate us. <laughs> okay, well, I'm good to go. Thank you, guys. Okay. Well, um, is there a motion for adjournment? Move for adjournment. Oh, second. <laughs>